Moving on to the excitation and inhibition process. In this presentation, I will discuss what happens in the dendrites and soma that leads to the firing of the neuron. Recall that a neuron is at resting potential until it receives enough chemical messengers to reach threshold. Once threshold is achieved, the neuron will fire its action potential. Also recall that in this example we're talking only about neuron-to-neuron -neuron communication. We'll address external sensory stimuli in the next part of this unit, uh, sensory uh, sensation and perception. Here we have my poorly drawn image uh, of a neuron with its primary parts labeled. The dendrites, which receive the chemical messengers from other neurons. The cell body, or soma, uh, which maintains the vital functions of the neuron. The axon hillock, where the integration of incoming messages takes place, and the axon, which sends a signal down its length um, to uh, release chemical messengers to other neurons. The neuron in this drawing um, is also shown to make a connection with the dendrite of another neuron. This connection is called the synapse, um, and is sh I'll show that in more detail later on. Uh, you can see that this particular neuron has made several synaptic connections, either with one other neuron or with many other neurons. In this even worse drawing, uh, we can see that neuron A is releasing its neurotransmitter into the gap between its axonal endings and the dendrite of neuron B. Um, I'm first going to describe the excitation process. Therefore, this neurotransmitter is likely to be glutamate, uh, which is the most common excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. The vesicles in the terminal button are first pushed up against the cell membrane, and then open to release the neurotransmitters. Glutamate molecules will cross the tiny gap between the point of their release from the axonal ending of neuron A and the dendrites of neuron B. Receptors in the next neuron will accept the glutamate um, and these receptors will only bind and that, that is they will only pick up molecules of a certain shape in this case that of the glutamate molecule. These receptors are connected to another type of channel called a neurotransmitter gated channel. In essence these channels can be thought of as doors that open when they are unlocked by the key that is the glutamate molecule. Sodium carries a positive charge adding positivity to the negative 70 millivolt charge within the neuron. This drives the voltage within the neuron to, let's say, negative 67 millivolts. This driving of the internal voltage closer to zero is called depolarization, and it serves to excite the neuron a tiny little bit. We call these small positive charges created by the entering sodium ions excitatory postsynaptic potentials, or EPSPs. The neuron, or if the neuron, is depolarized enough such that the threshold value of negative 65 millivolts is achieved, a major event occurs. The neuron fires an action potential, which is basically a spark of electricity that travels down the length of the axon and causes the release of the neuron's own neurotransmitter. If the sodium channels are opened several times, EPSPs travel the distance to the axon hillock such that sufficient depolarization occurs there to release the threshold value. However, this opening of the same set of sodium channels must be done in rapid succession, a process called temporal summation. A neuron could be excited by glutamate or any other excitatory neurotransmitter at several synapses simultaneously. The adding together of all of these inputs is what is called spatial summation. In order for an action potential to take place, the threshold value of negative 65 millivolts has to occur at the axon hillock, um, which is where the action potential is initiated. The inrushing sodium ions do not change the voltage value of the entire neuron, but only at the locale where these ions entered. That local excitation must travel all the way to the axon hillock in order to fire the action potential. Not all synapses involve the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. Uh, by some estimates, up to 80% of the synapses in the brain do not involve excitation at all, but serve instead to inhibit neurons. The most common inhibitory neurotransmitter is gamma-aminobutyric acid, or GABA for short. GABA is released by axonal endings in the same way that glutamate is, um, and the GABA also traverses the synaptic gap and binds to receptors on the dendrites.
GABA, too, fits into these receptors like a key in a lock and opens the neurotransmitter-gated channels. However, instead of opening sodium channels, GABA opens either chloride channels or it opens potassium channels. From our discussion on resting potential, we know that the net effect of the forces working on potassium is to push them out of the neuron. The resulting effect is to make the negative 70 millivolt potential inside the neuron even more negative, say to negative 72, negative 75, or even negative 80 millivolts. This process pushes the neuron's voltage level further away from its threshold of negative 65 millivolts. Therefore, more excitation is now required to fire an action potential. The greater the outflow of potassium ions, the more the inhibition, and with it the decreased likelihood that the neuron will fire. The outflow of potassium ions creates inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, or IPSPs. The inside of the neuron is pushed away from its threshold, that is, it is hyperpolarized. So with something like uh, 10 to 100 billion neurons in the brain, it's quite likely that at any given moment, a neuron is receiving information, uh, that is neurotransmitters, from several other neurons. Some of this information will be excitatory in the form of glutamate, which allows positive sodium to enter the cell, and some inhibitory in the form of GABA, which allows potassium out and chloride in. If the net voltage, the sum of the resultant EPSPs and IPSPs, reaches the negative 65 millivolt threshold, the neuron will fire its action potential. But it is important to remember that this threshold voltage cannot occur just anywhere in the neuron. It must occur at the axon hillock. In other words, it is at the axon hillock where the integration of input takes place. It is as if there's a little man uh, with a calculator inside the axon hillock adding the EPSPs and subtracting the IPSPs and if and when his calculator reaches negative 65, the little man presses a button that starts a cascade of events that results in the action potential.